My name is Dr Rebecca Beacon and I'm from the Health Behaviour Research Centre at University College London and I'd just like to start off by saying thank you very much to the conference organisers for inviting me to speak and in particular to Milka for organising this symposium. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity. So I'm going to be talking to you today about successful innovative methods of behavioural interventions. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about interventions that are trying to change people's eating behaviours, some of which are seeking to mainly influence diet and others that are more focused on trying to help people to manage their weight. So just to say that I have no conflict of interest to report in relation to this presentation. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to be covering today, I'm going to briefly talk about traditional approaches to behaviour change uh, and how effective these have been. I'm then going to be talking about an innovative approach to trying to change people's behaviour, which is through targeting automatic processes. And there are two ways in which you can do this. And the first is through nudging, and the second is through trying to help people to form healthy habits. And lastly, I'm going to quickly talk about new technologies as an innovative way of helping people change their behaviour in terms of the delivery of interventions. So the traditional approach to changing health behaviours, particularly from a public health perspective, has involved the provision of information and education. So what people should be doing and why they should be doing it in terms of trying to reduce their disease risk. And this information is provided either through leaflets or through social media campaigns. But what we know is that it's rarely sufficient in terms of prompting individuals to make long-term changes to their behaviour. And that's because unhealthy eating behaviours in many cases are not simply a consequence of lack of knowledge. We all, or most of us, know what we should be doing in terms of what we should be eating and how much, but not all of us do it, or at least not all of the time. And that's because behaviour is much more complex and there are a number of factors that influence whether or not we engage in a behaviour. So Susan Mickey and colleagues at the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change recognised that behaviour isn't that straightforward and they developed the COMBI model or the COMBI system of behaviour which reflects that behaviour is part of an interacting system that involves three necessary conditions that cover a number of factors which influence whether or not a person engages in a behaviour. And these three conditions are capability, which is a person's psychological or physical ability to enact the behaviour, opportunity, which is the physical and social environment that enables the behaviour, so things like access to healthy foods, and finally motivation, which is the reflective and automatic mechanisms that activate or inhibit a person's behaviour. And complex interventions, so those which aren't just providing information, typically try and take into account many of these factors that influence behaviour. And they include the psychological, social, societal and contextual determinants of behaviour, which are covered by these three conditions. Such interventions are typically based on psychological models of behaviour. And the majority focus on deliberate actions. So those actions which are driven by conscious reflection on the consequences of engaging or not in a behaviour. So in terms of whether these traditional approaches to changing behaviour have been successful, Susan Mickey and colleagues conducted a meta-analysis of 84 physical activity and healthy eating interventions. They identified 53 healthy eating evaluations, which overall had an effect size of 0.31, so quite small. But they also looked at which behaviour change techniques are most frequently featured in those interventions which are most effective. And what they found was that for the 13 healthy eating evaluations that used self-monitoring plus one other technique from control theory, so things like goal setting or feedback on progress, they were much more effective than those interventions that didn't include these kinds of techniques. So those interventions that focus on reflective mechanisms have shown some success, but it has been modest and it has been variable. And in so in recent years, there's been increasing interest in the innovative approach to behaviour change that involves targeting more automatic processes. So those things that we do without really thinking about them. And it's thought that this kind of approach to behaviour change might be particularly helpful in situations where a person's cognitive load is high, so they've got a lot to think about, a lot to try and remember, and so might be less able to think and reflect on the goals they've set in relation to healthy eating and act in accordance with those. 
So one way in which you can target more automatic processes is through a technique called nudging. And this first gained a lot of attention when Thaler and Sunstein published their book Nudge, which defined nudging as a technique that alters a person's decision-making context without removing options or changing the incentives in order to promote choice and behaviour in accordance to their own preferences, such as choosing healthy food over unhealthy food in a supermarket. So essentially, it's about trying to make the healthy choice easier. It's not trying to force people into doing something that they wouldn't want to do, but it's making it easier for them to act in accordance with a goal that they might have, for example, in relation to healthy eating or weight loss, through making it easier to make that choice without having to think about it. So, for example, altering where healthy foods are in terms of the position on shelves in a supermarket or even the location of an aisle in a supermarket. And in terms of whether these kinds of interventions have been effective, Van Cleef and colleagues from the Netherlands have conducted a couple of experiments looking at this. And the first was in a lab setting. And they looked at the choices made by participants from online shelf displays when there was a different percentage of healthy snacks available and where those healthy snacks were positioned in a different location on the shelf. And what they found was that if there was a high proportion of healthy snacks available, regardless of shelf position, people were very likely to go for the healthy snack option. If there were only a small proportion of healthy snacks available, people were far less likely to go for them and they were particularly less likely to go for them if those snacks were placed at the bottom of the shelf. They then replicated this experiment in a natural setting, so in a hospital canteen, and looked at the total number of snacks sold in the four different conditions. So again, looking at proportion of healthy snacks and also the position uh, of them on the shelves. And what they found was that in line with the previous results, if there was a high proportion of healthy snacks available, people were more likely or more of these kinds of snacks were sold compared to unhealthy snacks. And if there were less of these available, people were far less likely to buy healthy snacks, particularly if they were located at the bottom of the shelf. So in that condition, just over 10% of the snacks sold were healthy snacks, whereas in the condition in which 75% of snacks available were healthy and they were positioned at the top of the shelf, just over 90% of the snacks bought were healthy snacks. So it suggests that there's some evidence for effectiveness of nudging. Another approach to try and target these automatic processes is to use habit formation theory to help people develop habits for healthy behaviours. And according to habit theory, habits are automatically triggered actions that are formed through repetition in a consistent context that helps increase their automaticity over time. So for example, things like brushing our teeth before bed or locking the door behind us. The more and more we do them in the same context, the more automatic they become so that sometimes we might even forget whether we have locked the door or not because it was so automatic when we did it. And there is evidence that this approach can be used to help individuals learn healthy lifestyle behaviours. So my colleague Pippa Lally, at the HBRC was one of the first people to demonstrate that we can teach people or help people to form these habits. And she asked people to choose a specific behaviour, such as eating a piece of fruit or doing 50 sit-ups, and to repeat it daily in a consistent context. So eating the piece of fruit with lunch or doing the 50 sit-ups after your morning coffee. And she found that not only did people increase the amount that they did the behaviour on a regular basis as time went on, but in terms of how automatic that behaviour felt to them, this also increased over time until eventually it levelled off, suggesting that the habit had been formed. And so this led us to develop the Ten Top Tips intervention, which is a very simple leaflet-based intervention that describes 10 negative energy balance behaviours alongside advice on how to turn those behaviours into habits, so repeating them in this consistent context over time. And those behaviours included a number of healthy eating behaviours. And going back to how this approach compares to the more traditional approaches that are more focused on reflective processes, it's thought that this approach the habit-based intervention approach is likely to require less engagement or motivation on the part of the participant because the interventions that focus on more reflective actions are inherently high in demand for commitment. They require a lot more thinking about and deliberate action on the part of the participants than an intervention that's trying to get them to do things automatically as time goes on. They're also quite easy to explain, less time-consuming to explain and to implement. As I say, this is simply a leaflet. And because they're trying to 
turn the behaviors into habits and make them automatic, it's also more likely that these behaviors are going to be maintained over the long term. So it's hopeful that they could establish permanent behavior change rather than something that changes but then reverts back to previous behaviors at the end of the intervention. So my colleague Pippa Lally was again the first person to test out this intervention and she tested it out in a small scale study in a volunteer population. And she found that those people who received the 10 top tips not only lost more weight than a control condition over eight weeks, but they continued to lose weight up to 32 weeks, which suggests that these behaviours were being maintained over the longer term and is in support of this habit formation approach. So we then tested this intervention out in a randomised controlled trial in obese adults in primary care, where we were again looking at weight loss in those patients who received the 10 top tips um, versus those patients receiving usual care. And our primary outcome was change in weight over three months. And what we found was that those participants who received the 10 top tips did lose more weight on average than those who received usual care over three months. And this difference was significant. Overall, 16% of participants achieved clinically significant weight loss in the 10 top tips group. So weight loss more than 5%. So we also looked at weight loss over the longer term, this time over two years. And we found that patients who received the 10 top tips did maintain this weight loss from three months with a mean weight loss two years of just over two kilos. And in fact, by the end of the trial, a third of participants in the 10 top tips group had achieved this clinically significant weight loss of over or equal to 5%. So again, that suggests that these behaviours are being kept up over the longer term and helping people to achieve permanent behaviour change and continue to lose weight even at two years. We've also tested out this habit formation approach, targeting feeding behaviours in parents, so targeting feeding behaviours relating to children's fruit and veg intake, their intake of healthy snacks and their intake of healthy drinks. And again, we conducted a randomised controlled trial looking at whether a habit formation intervention would help parents to use these feeding behaviours compared to a no treatment control. And the primary outcome in this study was the habit strength for the behaviours, so how automatic they were at the end of the intervention. And what we found was that for all three of the target feeding habits, after eight weeks, these habits were much more automatic in those parents who'd received the habit formation intervention compared to those parents who received a control. In terms of how this impacted on children's intake, those children whose parents had received the habit-based intervention were eating more vegetables every day. They also had more healthy snack occasions and more water occasions every day. So there was some indication that it was having an impact on children's intake as well. So is habit formation a successful innovative method for behavioural interventions? Well, I think we have some evidence of success. But there is the potential to try and increase the impact of these interventions. So some of the effects were quite modest and it would be nice to see stronger effects. Obviously, in the 10 top tips, we did look at long term maintenance, but that's just one study. And I think it's important to look at this in more studies targeting different kinds of behaviours. And finally, it's important to look at how these kinds of interventions can be delivered at the population level. So how they can be delivered in terms of public health interventions going forward. We're testing these interventions out in other groups, um, such as cancer survivors. And I also have a PhD student, Natalie Kleiman, who's looking at the effect of adding an app, so a smartphone app, to the 10 top tips, which helps people to break unhealthy habits, so the no-go app. And this leads me on to new technologies, which potentially are an innovative way of delivering behaviour change interventions. And there are a number of different types of technology that we can use to deliver our interventions that might help them to be more effective or to reach a larger number of people. And the first form of technology we can use is the web, so web-based interventions. And these interventions have the potential to be very low cost. They can be adaptable. They allow participants to be anonymous. So for those participants who might feel self-conscious attending interventions face-to-face -face because of, for example, their weight, it removes that barrier. There's the potential to reach a large number of people, as I say, at a low cost because you're not having to see people in person. And there's also the potential for these interventions to be tailored at a low cost, through example, through the use of codes. A second type of technology that can be used is mobile health, so using smartphones in particular. 
And these interventions have a lot of the same benefits as the web-based interventions, and they also can be particularly helpful for participants in terms of self-monitoring, but also for us as researchers in terms of monitoring participants. A lot of phones have inbuilt trackers that we can take advantage of in terms of data collection. Um, and these interventions can also be helpful in terms of training participants in certain skills. So, for example, with the NoGo app, which is looking to train participants to break unhealthy habits. Mobile phones can be particularly helpful for that as you can carry them with you and you can use them in situations where you might be more likely to engage in a behaviour that you want to avoid, for example. Lastly, in terms of new technologies, there are video game interventions, and these are particularly exciting in terms of trying to engage perhaps younger audiences because they can be very fun, they can be very engaging. And they also enable us to give participants a novel perspective, and particularly with the development of virtual reality technology. So, for example, I have a colleague at the HBRC, Dr. Abby Fisher, who's looking at trying to improve adolescents' physical activity through showing them, using virtual reality, the effects of physical activity inside the body, and also how they would change over time if they were inactive or if they started to engage in activity. These interventions can also be used to help increase self-efficacy through showing people themselves engaging in a behaviour, which could potentially make them more likely to engage in it in real life as well. In terms of whether new technologies are effective, it's a very new area, particularly in terms of the sort of more video game or virtual reality technologies. But Thomas Webb and colleagues did a meta-analysis looking at internet-based interventions for behaviour change, and they found that they did have a small but significant effect on health-related behaviour. And as with other interventions, a more extensive use of theory was associated with these interventions being more effective for behaviour change particularly those interventions that incorporated more behaviour change techniques tended to be more effective than those that incorporated fewer. And effectiveness was also enhanced by the use of additional methods of communication. So, for example, the use of text messages was seen to be in a particularly effective method in terms of engaging participants. However, these new technologies are not without their challenges, and there are a number of things to think about as we go forward in terms of developing interventions using these designs. So, for example, although most people do have a smartphone, not everyone does, and similarly, not everyone has access to the internet, and certainly not everyone has access to virtual reality. So making sure that we aren't leaving certain groups out, particularly older age groups or people from more deprived backgrounds, is important in terms of using these technologies. There are also issues around confidentiality, particularly in terms of what data is being collected and ensuring participants are aware of what data is being collected, for example, from their smartphone. There are issues around reimbursing providers, especially if, we're, if you're using apps and selling these on, for example, Google Play or wherever they're being made available. We also don't know yet whether the behaviour change techniques that we know are effective in traditional interventions work in the same way when they're delivered through technology. So, for example, social support, if you're not seeing people face to face, might work in a different way. Similarly, self-monitoring, if it's easier to do it using a smartphone, might be less effective than if you're having to write down or keep a diary. There's also the issue of how we respond or manage rapidly changing technology. There are constant updates, constant new models, and this raises problems both in terms of how we evaluate these interventions, if the changes in technology have made slightly different changes to the interventions themselves, and there's also the issue of sustaining interest in interventions that perhaps are using what becomes quickly an outdated version of technology and how we help people to maintain behaviour changes over the long term. When with a lot of these technologies, a key aspect of their appeal is the constantly being something new. So these are all issues to, to explore going forward. And I think importantly, what seems to be coming out of work in this area is that technology isn't a magic bullet. And particularly, it's important to try and retain a human element, if at all possible. So just to conclude, hopefully I've shown that targeting automatic processes is an innovative method for behaviour change that has had some success to date, but there's definitely room for improvement. And particularly, there's a need for these kinds of interventions to be evaluated at the population level. Novel technologies provide an innovative method for delivering these kinds of interventions, but we need to explore the optimal use of them and also to address the new challenges that they bring. So I'd just like to acknowledge all of my colleagues whose work I've referenced in this presentation from both the Health Behaviour Research Centre and the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Professor Jane Wardle, who very sadly died on the 20th of October. She was a truly brilliant behavioural scientist and a wonderful mentor, and she is very much missed. 
Thank you.